Welcome to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. I'm your host, Matt Halloran. Being your own loud is not new to marketing, but the mindset, strategies, and resources to help you get there are evolving faster than this industry is keeping up. It is time to find a new perspective on what works why and how to move your business forward. Listen as I interview guests to help you learn from them how to be your own loud. Let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to another Top Advisor Marketing Podcast. I am your host, Matt Halloran. You know, one of the things here at Proudmouth that we think is really, really important is, is diversity. And there's one simple reason, and it's really a business reason. It's not just because it's the right thing to do, because it is. It's because when you have fresh new ideas that come into your organization, everything changes and your organization gets more efficient, it becomes more creative, and it actually is more reflective of the general population. We have a big issue in financial services. It's a bunch of old white guys. And what we need to do is we need to do whatever we possibly can to make it so that it is more diverse because we're going to be able to serve our clients even better. Our guest today is not only an expert in a highly sought after speaker, she's been on pretty much everything, everybody. Um, so you're going to find Lizetta. We're going to have all of her links in our show notes, um, but she is not only a financial advisor, but again, she's a sought after speaker. Uh, she is an absolute expert, not just being a great advisor, but also in how to help grow the industry because she's done it with her practice uh, and, and make it look really just more reflective of society. So Lizetta, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. Delighted to be here with you today. All right. I would like to have everybody hear a little bit about your story, and then we're going to dive into how we're going to start advancing uh, culture within financial services. Just a little information about my background. Um, I am the oldest of three. My parents are high school sweethearts. They um, graduated, married, and had me, so I grew up with them. I grew up seeing their struggle with money as uh, blue collar workers, construction worker for my dad, factory worker for my mom. And it was disheartening. It was disheartening to see so much love um, for us, but also so much struggle in taking care of us as a family. And so my question was, how can I um, help support my, my parents, uh, me as I became an adult and for generations to come? This quest to understand money, it took me on a path educationally uh, with getting two degrees in finance, undergrad at UVA, MBA at Wake Forest, and the conversations about money was related to investments, and we didn't have money to invest. I'm saying there has to be more in terms of personal finance. Thank goodness I stumbled upon a certified financial planner, Melissa Hamill, who exposed me to this profession. I said, aha, this is how I can put my finance degree and my passion, my why, in terms of helping underserved and overlooked populations get a handle on their money in a way that can help them live the best life that they can. And so with that trajectory, once I discovered the CFP, I said I wanted to start my own firm to be able to serve the people that I wanted to serve that not necessarily the industry financial services wanted to serve. And those were people who let, had less than $1 million in assets under management. So I founded Financial Fountains in 2008 um, also had um, a passion, you know, for nonprofits and investments as well, too, but decided working with boards, my goodness, let me focus on the individuals who may serve on boards and, and also individuals like my parents as well, too. So fast forward in 2019, I merged Financial Fountains with um, my business partner, Rianca Dorsonfield. She had your greatest contribution, and we decided to name our firm 2050 Wealth Partners because we know by the year 2050, the U.S. will be a racial mosaic, and we want wealth to transfer along with that. So that's my financial planning route. And because I was so passionate about Black advisors in the industry, I did a lot of volunteer work as well, too, um, advancing our interest, um, our voice as well in the industry. And uh, because of that work, known now as Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, I also founded a consulting firm, uh, Lizette and Associates as well. All right, I need to rewind. You said something early on there uh, that that I think well it just makes me want to ask you another question, which is, how did you find this CFP that you ended up saying I want to be like her when I grow up? How how did that happen? Because I think a lot of advisors, 
sit back and say, well, gosh, I would love to motivate people to get into this industry, but I don't even know where to begin. How did you end up finding her? And then how have you been findable, discoverable? I'm uh, sorry, findable is I'm sure not a word. I make up words on the show all the time. Discoverable. How do you make yourself approachable and discoverable so that people can say, I want to be like Lizetta when I grow up? Fortunate enough to um, meet Melissa through the relationship in the firm that I was working with at the time. So the firm that I was working with uh, allowed certified financial planners to have seats for private equity, right? So they were known as alternative investors, private equity, and oftentimes they're limited seats. And so Melissa Hamill's firm, interestingly enough, her dad, Richard Hamill, was one of the pioneers on the NAPFA, the fee-only journey as well too. So she was very engaged in, in NAPFA and the industry as well. So I got a double plus, one, triple, let's call it a triple blessing, female, <laughs> certified financial planner and fee-only, which was of interest um, to me. So that's how I discovered her through that work relationship partnership between a wealth management firm and a financial, the only financial planning firm. And the other interesting fact, she invited me to serve on the planning committee uh, for the conference. So not only did she expose me to the industry, help me understand how to get the CFP, she helped me meet other colleagues as well to confirm that's the model that I was interested in and recommended my first client. That's mentorship, that's sponsorship, that's allyship, <laughs> that's mentorship. Yeah. And there's, there's so much there that we could probably spend the whole podcast just, you know, um, deconstructing all of that. But this is a marketing show, right? So you and I talked about this when we had met previously. And, and you said something, again, I'm going to go back to what you had said, you know, that most advisors are really targeting people who are very close to retirement, have an easy 401k rollover or pension, who have over a million dollars or, or some sort of account minimum investable assets, because our industry has programmed advisors that that's how you run a profitable practice. It's the 100 rule, right? I mean, God, listen, I used to talk about this on stage, you know, 100 clients, each of them who have a million dollars, you're winning, right? You have a million dollars in revenue, you're not working that much, you got a great quality of life, you have a very sustainable practice, you went the other direction, right? And I am sure that there are listeners right now who are saying ah, her business model can't work. How, how can she make a living, you know, working with the masses? So I'm just going to ask you that. I'm going to pull a, um, you know, an old uh, Larry King sort of in uh, uh, asking question thing, because I really do think that that's what our listeners are looking for. So how have you done that? And I'm going to combine the part two of your previous question with this question as well, too, because you're like, how can advisors um, say, how can I be like Lizetta? And do I really want to be like Lizetta? Because she's not going for <laughs> big dollars, right? This is viable. So what I did, and speaking of marketing, was work with a marketing firm saying, how can I bridge the gap of what I want to do and clients understanding this? And she said, you know what? You're the financial planner for the rest of us. Ding, ding, ding. So I could own that, that we're not the 1%. And so that gave language to say, I'm speaking to you, everyday people who deserve access to financial planning. That was huge. And a lot of people are like, well, thank you for letting me know I deserve a financial planner. What is a financial planner? So that's the education aspect of it too, because everybody's used to investment, right? So the holistic approach. So by writing about it, talking about it, that lens, right? That helped on the, I would say the B2C, the business, the consumer, right? For them to understand this nebulous concept <laughs> of financial planning and how much it costs. Now, let's marry that with the B2B, the advisor, advisor. Is this a viable business model? What I know to be true is that our biggest asset is human capital. Everybody has human capital. The question is, how are you leveraging it? Human capital as an asset says, I have transferable skills for which I can earn income. Income is what you turn into wealth, particularly for first generation wealth people who do not receive inheritances or capital infusions and the like. So how do you make this viable? You become a line item in people's cash flow, right? And so they're like, okay, is this affordable? And then I say, well, how much did you spend on vacation for the year? 
uh, three, four, five, six thousand dollars in eating. And so I say, let's help you be able to have your vacation, eat out, and have a coach along the way, right? And then even more money that you can set aside for your retirement accounts, paying off your debt, um, hiring that estate planning attorney to get your documents done. You can have it all. You can. There's some trade-offs, but you can. And so that's how we've been able to make it viable is that we charge people on income. Everyone has income and it's a trust factor. And this is what the acronym I created for trust, trading resources using sustainable truths. So by trading clients, your expertise, your resources working hand in hand, everybody both slips. And the trust factor is huge. So going back to the financial planner for the rest of us, you can trust me. I get it. I get it because I was there, still there, <laughs> right? This is for advisors, meeting clients where they are, they have income, they spend it on other things. Let them know they're spending it on them and they're going to get a return that's holistic about it. And the next thing you know, they got assets under management. So we do retainer plus AUM. And as they grow, we grow together with it. Bam. Now, there's so much that you said there. So I have my marketing hats on, right? And I'm like, oh my God, did you hear that? I mean, this is like uh, from soup to nuts. You've got it all mapped out. Did you do this? Was this you? Uh, did you have somebody pull this out of your brain? Do you Are you naturally inclined for uh, acronyms and great talking points and focus from a marketing perspective? Or did you bring an outside consultant in who helped tease this out of your brain? Exactly. And let me also say with you culturally, so it's an Culturally, and not I grew an up or. in the black church. Okay. In the black church, you had to speak, believe in a case, <laughs> celebrate, right? In terms of the relational, emotional side of things, calling, who am I in this world? How do I reach others, right? So you got a passion play that may not be refined in life, but that helps you connect with people. Your why is like, oh, she's like me, black. Her parents, you know, didn't have a lot of money. I'm first gen wealth. I'm sandwich generation. Her parents ahead of me. I chose mommy, blah, 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 right? So not afraid of the EQ. And then I got the IQ, right? It's just like, I got to have the designation, the degrees. I got to have everything to put that in play, right? And then I have the benefit of a community that is cheering me on, right? And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be faithful, right? And then you say, I can only do but so much. I'm an expert. I'm an expert in finances. I'm not an expert in marketing. I got my MBA and I'm like, oh my gosh. I don't know if I'll necessarily get an A in this. I didn't, but I was faithful, right? And then I also realized people, and that's why I went to get my degrees as well too, networking, because if I don't know it, somebody else does. So it is being resourceful. And that's why it is an and, because you need all of it. It's just the question is, when do you activate it, pull that lever? Something we talk about a lot on the show is creating raving fans, right? Finding your, your tribe, your people, your ideal target market. And then if you speak to them using their language and the mediums they prefer while they're there, then they become an amplifier, which is the, the logo of our company here. Our whole idea is to amplify voices. And you've really, really successfully done that. Let's talk a little bit about this fan base that you've created. Uh, one, did it happen as quickly as you would think it would happen? And what are some of the actionable items that you've done to make it so that you're not only creating even more fans of Lizetta and the firm 2050, but you're also um, engaging your existing fans? So I chuckle because it's like, I have a fan club. I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you totally have a fan club. You absolutely do. So that hit me in an interesting way. And the reason why I say it hit me in an interesting way, because all I am is just me. And I, I give credit um, to my upbringing of if you can, then do. Like, so I was in everything. I played basketball I was a cheerleader I was in band I was at a beta club I worked two jobs it's like I had this unusual capacity craziness I'm realizing what it is now and so I I just in terms of gifts and what I enjoy doing and entertaining myself 
was just like, this is who I am, deal with it. Sorry, but not sorry. It's just like, oh, you know, and so this passion play, this determination, I'm also a Scorpio, true Scorpio, right? So it's just like, you have my parents saying, figure it out. You can do it if you can. I mean, if you can do it, do it. No big accolades. You make all A's. Well, if you can, then do it, right? There was no celebratory. You just, you just do it, right? And so that's what has worked in my favor, just being me and also getting therapy because all of that is not healthy messaging, <laughs> Right, because then you set up these expectations of other people saying, if Lizetta can do it, then I should be able to do it, but I'm not you, you're not me. And what I've done, I'm not saying it's necessarily recommend, that's something I would recommend, you know, as well either. So I am just grateful that people resonate um, with what I say and what has been important to me is independency. Now, this is a moment of truth for me. My ancestors were enslaved. They, they, they were not slaves, they were enslaved. And so my mantra in life is that I'm not for sale and I can't be bought. Any institution I'm affiliated with, the same concept. We are partners. I'm not less, I'm not more, we're partners. And so for me, the independency meant I can say and do whatever I want and I will take responsibility and ownership for because I own my human capital. I own my voice. I own my way in the world. And with that responsibility, if I have erred, I will work on that. But I will not be subject to cultures that want to suppress me or relationships that want to suppress me. And I think that liberating viewpoint that I have and sacrifices I've made and my family has made to keep that independency has been, yes, less, less money, maybe less opportunity, but what it means is being true to your own self on your own accord and to hell with stuff that should stay there in hell. <laughs> you got the country out of it too, so. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Uh, your, your accent changed just a smidge there. That was magnificent. Um, so, so we talk on this show all the time about, you, you know, uh, Oscar Wilde said, you might as well be yourself because everyone else is taken. And when you give yourself permission to be yourself, you have zero competition and you are about the most living proof of that, that I've had on the show in quite a while by everything that you just said there, you have given yourself a gift, which is also sometimes a mixed blessing, right? Um, are there less opportunities? No. Are, are you swimming in a hundred clients with a million dollars and you take six months off a year. No, you have a work ethic, right? And, and I don't know what generation you are, but I, I found as a gen, squarely generation X that the way that we were raised, we did things that I can't expect my kids to do, right? Because they weren't raised in the same environment. I mean, you said, so, you know, you worked a bunch of jobs, you know, you ground out school, you know, you had, you were in band, you did all of these sorts of things. Uh, you and I are, are, are similar in that experience that that was my existence. I tried to do everything I possibly could because I had no idea who the hell I was. And I figured somewhere I'd be able to find it. So sports, you know, musicals, athletics, you know, everything along those lines working working, working. Okay. So I, I want to, you said something else that, that I, I wanted to highlight here. Um, or I'm sorry, I want to ask you a question you didn't answer there. So I, I need, I want you to have you expound on something is time. So I believe that, that most people have a very unrealistic time frame of success. First off, they have a totally unrealistic expectation of what success means because they externalize and until in, instead of internalize and say, what does success mean to me? They're looking at the watches and the cars and the houses and all of that stupid stuff that our industry is so focused on. But from a time frame perspective, Lizetta, how did that go? Did it happen as quickly as you thought it would be? Um, are you hitting the milestones that you were hoping? Do you mind talking a little bit about how long it's taken you to build this fan base? I too am a Gen Xer. So I want to say that's why the similarities very much so as well too. And I started there because you said time, right? Gen Xers, we're next up for retirement, right? And when I wrote that article, I was like, ooh, that includes me. <laughs> <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Right? Yep. So you're like time, time. And so 
I also said I stumbled upon my career. So I discovered um, being a certified financial planner in my early 30s. I had already been married seven, eight years, had just had um, a newborn as well too. So I didn't have the benefit now of generations who are majoring in financial planning and immediately can start their career right away. Mine was delayed a decade. And then also I have, you know, uh, uh, a husband who has been moving up his career ladder as well too. Life just happens, right? Pivoting, restarting and the like. So what I would say today, I completely um, and where I thought I would be a wannabe, I didn't even know because I was taking a path that's been unknown <laughs> and almost kind of pioneering, which is kind of strange to even say that. And what I've done in terms of giving myself grace, I keep reminding myself that Avira Wang started her um, bridal at 54, right? And, you know, even Ray Kroc with McDonald's. So I said, you know, I have to toss this notion of certain milestones and even certain success. I have had success because I did find my calling because I am working with um, generation, the millennials and Gen Z as well too. I have a Gen Z daughter. So I get to say some things. And then I also position myself to say, um, I have, you know, even elevated even more of my human capital that I'm going to translate that more into passive you know, approaches are just advisory approaches for which I can command, right? So when they said that, you know, at age 50, you can start doing catch-up contributions <laughs> for retirement, I'm like, I'm seeing this in terms of accelerating, right? Any asset potential as well too, and I'm okay. You know, the principles about, with my clients about how to pivot, what success, what makes you happy, it's fluid. Um, and I also say time is a currency as well, too. So I'm designing, we as a firm are designing how to leverage these currencies that are available to us in the right now, not at a certain juncture. You don't have to wait. So to me, life is pretty good. And I have to keep reminding myself that because outside forces, you should have this in AUM, you should have this, and you should have that. And, you know, and I'm like, I'm back to take that stuff to hell. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't like the fact that people put other people's expectations on themselves. I mean, it, it's good to have paths or goals or milestones, because I think it's something good to strive towards. But you, I love the fluidity component of it. And I think our generation, fluidity is something that has just been part of our existence since really day one, right? Uh, the fact that... Um, so it's interesting that you say, you know, you got into financial services, uh, you know, uh, at 30. Um, I got into my any semblance of the career that I'm in now at, at 37, 38 years old, right? I mean, I had all sorts of other jobs and careers before, you know, I landed here. And luckily, um, the wind blew me in this direction and I put the wind on my back and I trusted my, the wind and said, okay, you know what, uh, let, let's see what happens. All right. So, uh, I'm just, what a, what a wonderful perspective. Uh, there's so much that I know people are going to take away from this. And I want to ask you one other quick question because the lizetta.com consulting firm that you've created, I think there are a lot of financial advisors, and, and maybe I'm being optimistic there because I'm a fiercely optimistic person, that this industry is fundamentally going to be more representative of the American culture um, and, and really the population. How do people find people, Lizetta? Uh, just there's so many people are like, Matt, you know what? We put all of these ads out and uh, you know, I'm trying to attract um, anybody who doesn't necessarily look like me, how, how can you help with that? Do, what advice do you have so that they can really hire and retain a diverse talent? Hire and retaining, that is an implementation strategy. As a financial planner, you don't start with the implementation, you start with the plan. Yay. All right. So the plan goes back to what are your goals? What are your values? And I'm saying you as a firm, who are you? A lot of firms have not defined find that for themselves, particularly the small. It's like mission, vision, values. That's what the big, no, that's even more so, right? Because you're building a foundation that has to have that weed into as you build, as you grow as well. So 
start there. Who are you? And then why? What is your why? Why do you want to have a more diverse population? Because is it the end thing? Right. And diversity is just a starting point. So would even diverse people be interested in you? That's that's an interesting uh, assumption. If you haven't self-reflect as a firm and you don't have infrastructure in play that shows this messaging throughout that is authentic. Right. As well, in terms of your plan. And then the next piece of this, when you've done the work or doing the work, because it's a continuum, then when you invite people in, you can say this is where we are. We would like to get better and we see how your skill set, who you are, can help complement that, right? That is an authentic partnership as well. Then I also believe that people who are the minorities coming in, they should get combat pay <laughs> because it's anticipated that those who, who have the experience are going to educate those who don't and you don't get compensated for it. That is crazy and that needs to be rethought completely, but that's that's my view on that. And then the next step is you will feel prepared when you bring people in, but even before you bring it in, who do you have in and are they your advocates? Have you asked them, is this a hospitable place, an inclusive place? Do you feel like you belong, right? So if you're talking about hire and retention, let's go to retention first, if who you already have there, are they advocates? They're your best frontline people to say how you need to pivot. Common sense. But the part is, is firms are scared to look in. They're scared of the truth. Yeah. Humans, we are. And so the work starts with you. You are a leader. You're in a firm. Fess up. Get it out. Have courageous conversations. Be vulnerable. That invites hospitality collaboration uh, so i, I want i want to i want to pause you there because because be vulnerable one of the things that, that's been on my journey is is realizing um all of the stupid stuff uh that i just i didn't realize was stupid stuff right um so as, as we wrap up today's show what sort of advice do you have how can people be as vulnerable as they need to be, as reflective as they need to be, but also when they mess up, because we will, right? That you will say something that you had no idea was, and, and this happens, I know you've experienced this, because you, but not only the combat pay with the fact that they're not getting paid to learn, but also because they're probably dealing with entrenched issues that a lot of people don't even realize are issues, which, you know, I can't tell you, how many times I've had somebody say to me, wow, Matt, do you know the origin of what you just said there? And I'm like, oh my God, like uh, I had no idea. So how, how do you help with that? How do you help that level of reflectiveness? How do you, do you have something that you found works really well when somebody does say something uh, that one, they didn't intentionally mean to come across as being as terrible as it might've been? Um, do you have any assistance with that? You have to presume that the person is interested in hearing what you have to say, goodwill, which may or may not be the case. So I'm gonna take it from a perspective, like you just said, Matt, you said something like, oh, Matt, and I, let's say I didn't know you. And I would just, because of me, in terms of my confidence, you pick and choose your battle. Is it something, because you don't know, right? And so for me, because this is my work, I test the soul. And I would say, can I share something with you, right? To kind of prep the Sure. And I would say what you just said, this is how I heard it. Right. And so, and, and then I say, this is how I heard it may not be what you had said, but this is how I heard it. And I would go, da, 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 da. Now I have done that in a context that was received and not received. The not received, it was a flare up. You're calling me a rain, da, 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 tears is flowing, and it ended up making it about that person. And I'm like, you know what? That person wasn't ready. And I'm like, but guess what? They now have the burden of awareness. And so my work is done. It's a goodwill, it's giving space, it's saying, this is what I heard, giving the person the opportunity of how they will respond. And it's theirs to decide. That's not on me. It was no malice. And so 
the person on the receiving end, the question of ones who, who have privilege, right? You, and the reason you have privilege is because you don't know a lot of things <laughs> that we're talking about because privilege has shielded you from having to know and experience, right? In certain areas. And so a person of privilege, I have privilege as a business owner, right? Employees or everybody has a privilege, which means an advantage based on different elements. So a person with privilege has to be sensitive to their privilege so they can be open and have capacity to listen and not feel attacked. And that's what any relationship any relationship and people are not are trying to compartmentalize it's like we are human to human human as a partner as a spouse as a business as a, it's human to human you're the second person who's used that phrase that simple in to me in a podcast in the last week matt it's not b2b it's not b2c it's h to h and i love that so much that's so powerful I, I love the idea that you are not going to, it's not you, it's me, right? And so that, that's one of the things that, that, that uh, has been rather eye-opening uh, to me is, is, is one, understanding the privilege that I have, uh, accepting that that's my reality and that other people don't have that same reality. Um, and then trying to say, okay, so here's where Matt Halloran is. Here's where Matt Halloran wants to go because I don't want to be like that. And I think a lot of people are like, well, I'm just me. That's who I am. But man, aren't we supposed to grow as human beings? I mean, isn't that kind of what the whole life journey is about to get better, faster, stronger, smarter? I mean, isn't that, isn't that what we're here for? Oh, uh, but that's work. It's work. That's why I keep saying doing the work. And it's a continuum. And this is the other thing too, I have to say this, Matt, is I wasn't always the person that says, this is me I share with you. That was not always me. I had a lot of rage, a lot of rage. Um, and I also think that there has to be some capacity, capacity for rage. So I would say, you need to have the capacity to deal with my anger. It's not directed at you, but this is how I feel. And I'm not saying I feel good about the way it's coming out. It's messy. So I also wanna give room for the messiness to have capacity for the emotions and the spectrum so that you can come back to balance. And that takes work. So just as people are sensitive about being uncomfortable, that's all of us. I'm uncomfortable because of the scars, of the trauma, of the infractions that still go on. And I use the spiritual language, you know, because that's a part of who I am, you know, and Jesus said, turn the cheek. And I'm just like, I don't know, but you also turn the tables over too. So I'm still wrestling. <laughs> So I need that disclaimer too, that I'm trying as well too. We all are trying and it's messy, but it's worth it. You're not the only ones uncomfortable. You being white people, you're not the only ones that can get uncomfortable. We live uncomfortable. Well, I appreciate your optimist that, that many people are trying because I, I still don't think that there are enough people trying. I don't think that there's still enough people being reflective. Um, I think that it's, I think we need to hear the rage. Uh, it can't always be, you know, sunshine, rainbows and flowers that, you know what you did there? No, you know what, what you did there? The, here's where you went wrong. And in fact, that's how I entered uh, into this is, is we actually had uh, hired a, a young lady uh, who opened my eyes to so many things uh, and I wasn't, and, and again, I just wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't on my radar, but when my radar got expanded and opened and I still make mistakes on a regular basis, um, oh my God, I just realized, hey, I can be a better version of myself. And, and yes, it is work. I agree. But I want all of our listeners to realize that 
life isn't supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be clean. You're supposed to go down in scarred and on fire. You know, uh, my old, my old boss, my mentor used to say, you know, Matt, so many people are trying to arrive at death safely. Uh, and, and I just don't think that that's the way it should be. I think you need to challenge yourself. Many of you do it personally. Many of you do it professionally, but I think you need to do it in this area too. And the more you do, the more you're going to learn and the better off you're going to be as just a human being and the better planet that we can live. And I know that might, again, that sounds wildly idealistic, but man, I got to have that. I got to have that. Thankfully that there are people like you who can help organizations wake the hell up, ask the questions on the front end, screw the plan. We got to do all this work before we even start laying the infrastructure. And Lizetta, that's why I was very, very grateful that you've taken some time. I know you're very, very busy. So I want to thank you very much for your time today. And I want to leave you with two, two quick things. Uh, number one, uh, who should reach out to you? Uh, because I know you've got Lizetta.com. So who is a, is a good client for you from a consulting standpoint? And then I have one other quick question for you. So I've worked with small shop, um, single sole prop proprietors, RIAs, all the way up to the billion dollar firm. I meet people where they are. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we'll make sure that uh, Lizetta.com is in the show notes. And then my last question for you is, did I do anything today that you would say, you know what, Matt, you said something and I think you should think about it differently. Is there anything that I did throughout the show that you could give me feedback on? Not at all. And the reason why is because you're a great listener and you're open and you're transparent. Um, and I thank you. So all I have to say to what you said is, Amen. And we're going to leave it with that. Everybody, if you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure that you do. Uh, leave us a quick review or rating on iTunes or wherever you're listening to the show. That'd be great. And if you haven't checked out the Pod Rocket Academy and you want to learn how to start your own podcasting, it's free. Podcasting 101 is the course that you want so that you too can stop being the best kept secret. So for Lizetta and all of us here at Proudmouth, we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thanks for listening to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. If you want to know more about how you can be your own loud, visit us at proudmouth.com and sign up for the Pod Rocket Academy. Through courses and office hours led by professional podcast producers and digital marketers, you will learn everything you need to know to become the trusted subject matter expert you were meant to be.